Finance Committee order. Um, uh, Chair Davids, I want to thank you for your patience. We have multiple committees going on, so in order for us to get quorum, we had to pull some folks from different areas. So thank you for your patience and to your testifiers. And welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I have some thank yous that I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, make here. First of all, Chair, to you uh, for including this in, in your omnibus bill. Chair Detmer, for all your work on the Veterans Committee, your tremendous staff. Uh, I have with me today uh, Mr. Joe Hoffman, the City Administrator from Preston. We have the ED, EDA Director. I have the, uh, with me today the Veterans Services Officer, Mark Hort, uh, from Fillmore County. Uh, Commissioner Bakke, and I have to say the county commissioners have been so supportive of what uh, we're trying to do here. Uh, the Veterans uh, Home Committee, the local one, and, and members, I have handouts here that, that are in my will be in my office. A very good piece put together uh, by the Preston uh, Veterans Home Committee, and so I'll have those in my office. They did a really, really good job on this. So with that, uh, I'm excited to be here today uh, to uh, add my support to uh, not only the Preston Veterans Home uh, project, but also those from Montevideo and Bemidji. Uh, this is the time to uh, put to build these uh, three veterans homes. We have the capacity. Uh, we need to get these funded and moving because even if we took care of everything uh, this session, which I hope we do, we're still looking about five, possibly six years out before this gets done. So. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Anderson and Chair Detmer, for your work on this issue. I'd like to turn it over for some uh, brief comments from City Administrator Joe Hoffman, City of Preston, uh, and then to the head of the, the co-chair, and we have Mr. Gildner uh, uh, here also, who is uh, the other co-chair of the Preston Veterans Home Committee. So with that, Madam Chair, if I could please turn it over to City Administrator uh, Mr. Hoffman. Welcome to the committee. If you can please state your name for the record and who yes, you Chair represent. Chair Anderson, uh, members of the committee, I'm Joe Hoffman, City Administrator for the City of Preston. I think as the committee uh, is familiar, there are four uh, skilled nursing veterans care facilities in Minnesota. Uh, currently, it's my understanding that there are about 1,000 names on that waiting list, and those waits can be anywhere from 6 to 15 months. Uh, the 15 counties of southeastern Minnesota, which we refer to as our catchment area, uh, contains about 47,000 vets and does not contain a veteran's home. Uh, the demand study for the Preston area indicates an immediate need uh, for 224 beds, and the Preston community is proposing a 72-bed facility. Uh, there is significant local match, and I think you'll see that from our two sister uh, proposals as well. Uh, the Preston community will be providing a 15-acre shovel-ready site. Uh, the total value of all contributions uh, exceed $3 million. And we have individual veterans have, who have pledged upwards of $20,000 dollars 20, of their personal funds uh, in the efforts to create this home. Uh, and so to that end, I would yield the remainder of my time uh, to the star of our presentation, uh, Mr. Scable. And Mr. Scable, are you by any chance related to the former Senator uh, Scable? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Chair Anderson, committee members, uh, thank you for giving me just a couple of minutes here. But yes, I am a third cousin to Kendrick Scable. Oh, funny. So that being said, uh, I'll be, I'll be brief here. It's been 50 years for me since I left the Republic of Vietnam as a U.S. Army. I got out of there as a sergeant and so happy to be there, so happy to be here and be in this state in this time. And uh, I made myself a promise and to my fellow comrades uh, at that time to do whatever I could to help their causes because there's a lot of veterans out there that are much less fortunate than me. I'm not doing this for me. I feel I've had some success in business and I have the resources to go into my later years in some sort of a care center, but there's a lot of folks out there that don't. I see them on a daily basis. I work for them. I'm in the construction business and I work with them and work for them. I can name names from the communities of Lanesboro and Harmony, uh, veterans that wear the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star with Valor, uh, neighbors of mine, friends of mine to this day. And not a day goes by that I don't think of back to that Republic of Vietnam experience. I grew immensely in that year. I mean, in character, I believe, and in being humble. Uh, we all should be thankful we're here. This great state has huge resources. The 20 or 30 or 50 million, whatever this number ends up being, is a small amount of money to put towards our veterans, especially the aging ones and the ones that don't have the resources to care for themselves. It's just huge. We just need it, and we need it now. 
and we're not doing this for me. I, it, by the time this five year span goes by, I may not even be able, but keep in mind, we have young men and women in an all volunteer service now. It's all volunteer. They're putting themselves in harm's way every day, every day and every night for us, so we can live and make these decisions we need to make for this great state and our great country. So I urge you to fund this thing and let's get this into the federal hands as soon as we can so no more time slips away. I always say in a little saying, it's a catchphrase that uh, most of the folks in the area, and myself included, uh, we're, at, uh, we're at Walmart or Kmart or Kohl's and the young soldiers, the 3% or whatever that percent is, they're out there, they're at war. Don't think Afghanistan and Iraq and all those places are any fun place to be <coughs> watching over our freedom. So I thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Mr. Skivo. Or Skivo, excuse me. Um, Chair Davis, any final comments at all? No, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. Uh, Chair Detmer, for the work you've done uh, on this is a very important project, and I hope we can shepherd it all the way through. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, I'm going to call up Amana Video, Marv Garvey, next, uh, and Representative Miller. Chair, we're doing some shuffling. I'm going to okay. let it, I'm gonna let it you go first. Oh, sure. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Come on, Representative Bliss. And we wanted to get you guys in first because you all traveled quite a distance. So we appreciate you coming in. Representative Bliss. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, you again, Madam Chair, for your leadership and Chair Detmer on uh, your leadership on this issue. Uh, this is an issue that's been uh, of great importance to our community for more than 10 years. And I have two of the members uh, that have been driving this for those uh, that time frame, and I'd like to turn it over to them. Uh, first, I have uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scotty Allison. Welcome to the committee. If you can please state your name for the record and who you represent. It's actually Colonel Retired Scotty oh, Allison. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am the uh, Beltrami County Veteran Service Officer. Uh, I'm working on the Veterans Home Task Force in the North. Uh, uh, Northern for the Northern Minnesota Veterans Home. So I just point out that uh, yes, we've been working it for 11 years. The need continues to grow. The veterans are continuing to age. Uh, we have over 27,000 veterans in our 16 county catchment area. Uh, one thing I would point out that we have one third, one third of all Native American warriors live in our area within a, an hour and a half of Bemidji. We have a lot of local support. We've raised over uh, two million plus to help with the efforts to get a veterans home in Bemidji. Uh, we also have a large population up there of veterans that are highly disabled, meaning that they meet the 70% or more service connected, which means that the per diem rate for those veterans when they go into a veterans home is gonna be much higher. You've heard this all before there, uh, Chair Anderson. So I'm just going to turn it over to Joe, and he's just going to talk a little bit about geography. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Mr. Venny, welcome to the committee. If you can state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Joe Venny, retired superintendent of the Northwest Jubilee Center, my first piece of public service. Retired Beltrami County Commission, Commission, my second piece, and now veterans uh, liaison for the legislative matters. Let may ask you to conceptualize within the geographic framework of the 9th Judicial District, which from uh, Crowing County on the south-southeast to Kitson County on the north-northwest is 25,000 square miles. And within that geographic landmass, we have 26,000 plus veterans by virtue of distancing from pre-existing veterans homes uh, that are either underserved or unserved. So we put together our uh, pro forma. It speaks for itself. We don't gain say on veterans no matter where they're found to be living. But we ask that we among the three receive a serious <coughs> consideration to move this initiative ahead because we've been at this now for 11 years and soon actuarials will be hunting all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Benny. I appreciate it. Representative Bliss, any final comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your time and consideration. Please move this forward. Thank you. Thank you both, all, all three of you. Okay, Representative Miller.
Thank you so much, Moore. Madam Chair and members. And, and you all have heard much of what we've talked about. I too have books that will be available in my office uh, should any of you want to know more about this project. But I really want to take this time uh, to thank all of you for the work that you've put forward to this point, many of the people in this room, many of the people around here. I, I thought of this, and if I could do this very quickly and simply, and this is for the audience members, whoever has had either was in the military, is a veteran, has a family member who is a veteran, and has a family member currently serving in, in the military in some way, just quickly raise your hands. Wow. See, and look at that room. The subject matter that we're talking about today affects all of us, and I think uh, Chair Anderson, you did a great job earlier when you said this is about being, bringing, people, bringing veterans home to their families. And that's what we're trying to do. We have these small communities. Joe Venny, who does such a great job, an incredible job talking about the massive distances that they have to travel. These are all rural districts. Uh, out here in Montevideo, we have a great expanse that's really represented, not just the town of Montevideo. We're talking seven, eight different counties that are going to be benefited by this. I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, a couple really great people who have worked on this for an incredible time. They are really the champions of a lot of this work. Uh, they've done, they've been dedicated. When we say they've put it in 11 years, this is not something that started 11 years ago and then they just kind of kept coming back. They've continually worked year after year after year. I'm honored and humbled to be able to be part of this with these two people and I'm going to let them go ahead and explain a little bit about Montevideo. Mr. Garvey, welcome to the committee. If you can state your name for the record. Chair Anderson, members of the State Finance Committee, thank you again for allowing us to testify for the proposed three veterans homes. First, my wife is starting to ask me of 56 years why I'm coming to St. Paul all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd like to recognize our group of veterans back there from the Montevideo area. And uh, what saddens me is the number that have been coming down these last 11 years that are no longer with us mm -hmm. because they have passed on to uh, their glory. My name is Marvin Garvey. I'm the chair of the Montevideo Area Veterans Home Committee. I have served 37 years in the Minnesota Army National Guard, retiring as a Chief Warrant Officer 4. I'm also the commander of American Legion Post 59 and a member of our Post Honor Guard. We fully understand that you have enormous, enormous requests for bonding and must prioritize each and every one. Our request is going into its 11th year. That means for the last 11 years, veterans have been denied care that you promised them when they took an oath to defend states and nations. You, as their elected representatives, have a responsibility to honor that promise. There are three communities vying for a veteran's home. There are sufficient beds available, 234, to construct three 72-bed facilities. They are necessary in all three communities. Some of us have been at this for 11 years, and each year there's another reason it cannot be funded. We fully support multiple locations throughout the state to best serve our veterans. This is further evidenced by a news release from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs dated August 21, 2017, and I quote, by incorporating a consideration for the need of veterans in rural areas into the ranking priorities for grant application in the regulations. States may find it easier to compete for the le limited VA construction grant funding that is available. We want to remove the red tape. Veterans in rural areas need to be able to get the nursing home care when it's needed, as close as possible to their homes, families, and friends. And in the quote, and that quote was by the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. And this is contrary to what you've been told, that homes should be built where the greatest concentration of veterans are. The Montevideo Area Veterans Home has an excess of $5 million pledged towards construction. Our community invested in excess of $150,000 in research, engineering for pre-design, soil borings, annual updates of pre-design, and construction costs. The proposed site has all the infrastructure in place to include the tarred streets with curb and gutter. We could dig tomorrow if the funding was available. These pledges, along with infrastructure, are a major portion of the state share. Montevideo has a community outpace cl clinic, which is a cost saving for treatment of the veterans. The CBOC currently serves 2,440 veterans in our area and also serves 728 through telehealth and home health care. 
No one understands the sacrifices these veterans endured while in combat, and only another vet veteran fully understands their feelings. Our veteran veterans need their home. It is your responsibility to provide for them as they so honorably sacrificed for us. Here they can visit with their comrades and have something in common to talk about. They will have skilled nursing staff that understands war injuries, both physical and mental. Our rural vet veterans have gone too long without the care they so richly deserve. We trust you will not let this happen. Therefore, in closing, we strongly support using leftover funds from the Viking Stadium to be used to construct these homes to serve our veterans. In fact, the Viking Stadium was built while we were working toward construction of these homes at the expense of our veterans. God bless our veterans and the state of Minnesota. Do you have any questions? Uh, Mr. Garvey, I don't think I've ever asked you this. So I had my aunt and uncle lived in Montevideo for years, both served in World War II. Um, Stanley, we always called him Leif Erickson and yeah. <laughs> uh, Maxine Erickson. And so. Um, yes, I know him well. I knew exactly where they lived. Did you, yeah, it's a great yeah. house. I love that yeah. house too. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And, and welcome to the committee. If you can state your name for the record and who you represent. My name is Angie Steinbach. I'm the assistant city manager for the city of Montevideo and also the spouse of an Army National Guard veteran. I'm here as just um, supporting Marv today in his testimony and for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Steinbach. Thank you. And Representative Miller, any other comments? Madam Chair, just thank you very much for this work and for your time. Thank you all. Thanks for coming today. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Johnson, did you want to testify as well? Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and who you represent. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, Benjamin Johnson, Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I want to thank the committee and all those present for the support um, exhibited for our state's veterans, and I want to say thank you for this, uh, this proposed appropriation. Um, I'll defer to MMB to comment on the source of the funding, but um, needless to say, uh, we understand the, the value of putting money into the hopper to get applications into the federal government for the federal portion of the matching grants. Uh, our concern is that uh, what is available here, um, what is available here is not sufficient uh, based on our estimates to get um, 72 bed facilities built in all three of these homes. We are supportive of construction for uh, these new homes in uh, the three locations identified in the, um, the bill. Um, our estimates include, uh, our estimates result in uh, a, a $21.9 million state portion. Um, uh, this appropriation identified puts the onus on these communities to continue their fundraising efforts. Um, I do want to point out uh, the caveat that this $21.9 million is an estimate based on a midpoint of construction of 2024. Um, that is assuming that the federal government continues to operate at its previous pace of funding these federal, uh, the federal portions. Uh, it has recently come to our attention that the uh, President and um, Congress have appropriated a significant investment in state home construction grants, um, looking to wipe out the existing backlog of projects. Uh, so the uh, estimates that our agency, along with uh, Department of Administration and J.E. Dunn as a contractor, um, There's work to be done. We, we understand what the cost would be, and there's an, an escalation along, um, along with each, of, each quarter, assuming um, contracting uh, goes as it has in the past 10 years. Uh, MDVA is able to develop the requisite operational planning for these three new homes. We understand what the costs will be. We've got projections on uh, how we would accomplish that. Um, I would note that, um, that the agency currently has a $38 million backlog of deferred maintenance for our existing facilities, and I would encourage uh, uh, Chair Anderson and the uh, legislators to support uh, the governor's request for asset preservation for our existing facilities of $13.1 million. These are our most important priorities and are included in our request for the omnibus, um, the omnibus bonding bill. Um, I won't belabor the point. Uh, these projects uh, deserve the support. Uh, the governor has indicated his support for uh, new veterans' homes construction. 
we appreciate the creativity um, and are interested in providing whatever guidance and assistance we can uh, going forward to uh, continue this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Members, any questions? Representative Detmer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Johnson, for I know you're always uh, up front when, uh, when the action is with the, our veterans issues, and I really appreciate uh, uh, the support and also support of the Commissioner Shelato and his staff. And uh, I know with our five veterans homes that we have in Minnesota currently at Minneapolis, Laverne, Hastings, Silver Bay, and uh, um, Fergus Falls, uh, we currently are allow currently we have 824 beds i think you pre you, you gave your presentation uh, earlier the, uh, this past week and uh, with the proposed uh, bemidji montevideo and preston uh, that would bring us up to 200 another 216 beds for a total of 1040 beds now the federal government uh, i believe they've they've correct me if i'm wrong they've allowed us uh, 1058 beds uh, that changes from year to year with the federal government. They, they take a look at the state and, and the number of veterans we have. I, I believe we have about 328,000 veterans that uh, currently live in Minnesota. And uh, so could you just t talk to us a little bit about, about uh, where the federal government gets these uh, 1,058 beds for the state of Minnesota? And we would still be below that. So, Mr. Johnson. Chair Anderson, Representative Detmer, uh, you are correct. The federal VA has allocated 1,058 beds or rooms for veterans or their spouses in, in this case to the state of Minnesota. Um, they base that number on the number of veterans in the state, the number of veterans that are uh, service connected, disabled at 70% or greater. Um, and it is actually, it's a, it's a static number, but uh, is revisited every 10 years. So in 2020, uh, the federal VA will, will um, rework their calculations to determine what each state will be uh, allocated. Uh, your, your math is also um, uh, accurate in that we have 800, uh, 834 built out. Uh, three new homes would, would put us close to the federal cap. Um, if Minnesota receives a reduction in the federal uh, number of beds available based on our declining veterans population, um, we would still continue to receive funding from the federal VA for anything that's constructed. Um, I would note that in terms of uh, the priority listing at the federal level, uh, those receiving state, those projects receiving state funding, uh, e equivalent to 35% of the construction costs, uh, go into priority group one. Uh, priority group one is further uh, further delimited in uh, into sub priorities 1.1 through 1.7. 1.7 being the lowest of priority group one uh, for states with the limited need. Um, in our case, the the uh, difference between what we've got built out and what we could have built out is less than 999. So we're sort of in the lowest priority group um, if we have state money available. Um, I would note that um, the option to, to bond for this construction versus funding it through um, the transfer of the, the stadium funding, um, bonding is, is probably a cleaner way to do it. Um, but I understand that the hesitation to do it in that regard. So. Um, we're not here to provide advice about the source, but um, we believe it would be easier to get applications submitted if we had the full state portion available um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, sure. and, and Madam yeah. Speaker, and just a comment here, you know, I've been able to uh, look at these requests for several years now, and I think if you look at the three communities that have made these requests, we're working on this project of Veterans Home for over 20 years, if you combine the three communities that, that have been working on this. And uh, I made this statement uh, a few years back at the Vets on the Hill, is that when, when, we, when veterans here across the state of Minnesota start talking with one voice, we have all the different branches of the military. As soon as we all start talking with one voice, we, we start, things start to happen. And I think this is what we're starting to see here in Minnesota, is that our veterans groups are starting to come together and uh, um, we had a town hall meeting that Chair Anderson uh, conducted. Uh, uh, we traveled around the state uh, a year or two ago, and we're out west, I think, uh, Representative Miller's uh, district, and there was a World War II veteran that came to the mic. We had an open mic, and he sat down. He was very, very uh, uh, respectful to all of us and very well-spoken. And he said, uh, you know, and he was one of the younger World War II veterans at the time, which is in your early 90s. And, and uh, that whole, that whole 
group of veterans, you, I would say in, a, in about 10 years, that generation might be gone. And we're looking at the next generation of veterans, the Korean War veterans that are also in our homes. The Vietnam War veterans are following, following suit. And what this World War II veteran said, he said, uh, by the time this veteran's home is built, uh, I, won't, I won't be here. But he's here to speak on behalf of the veterans followings following him. And that, that, uh, that has uh, stuck with me um, for a couple years now, and I'll keep repeating that. He also said that, uh, I think he was quoting um, uh, President Reagan. Uh, I, I, I heard this quote before. He says, a character of a nation, or we could say a character of the state, the character of the nation is how well we treat our veterans. And it can be judged that way. And you think about the young veterans that are looking at what we're doing right now, or these young men and women coming out of high school that are thinking about serving our country. They're watching. They're watching what we're doing with our veterans today. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the work that you're doing on this. Thank you, Chair Detmer. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I'm just, you mentioned the bonding component. Now, I know the governor put out the $1.5 billion bonding package, package of his. Were the vets home included then in that package at all? Chair Anderson, no, no they were not. He focused his, uh, his, his um, uh, jobs bill on uh, state agencies and um, institutes of higher education, um, but uh, c commented that he was interested in working with legislators on uh, local community projects, including um, those that had been submitted for consideration for new veterans homes. But if I'm understanding, I think that sec segment was to be funded with cash, correct? I, I, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Chair, could you clarify the portion funded with? The local portion that he was speaking of would have been funded under what he was proposing would be a cash rather than bonding. Oh, I, or am I, I may be beyond your wheelhouse too. I was just curious, but thank you, Mr. Johnson. Anyone else that wishes? Representative Lilly. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I, uh, Representative Detmer uh, and others. Uh, um, I, I'm lucky enough to serve on capital investment with you and others, and uh, we have huge capacity as a state to, to do this. And I mean, we, the numbers, uh, we could actually go up to a $3 billion bill and not have uh, tons of trouble as a state. And uh, it drives me a little crazy because uh, we've always had this uh, barrier and then somewhat to both sides, but I think the governor's kind of punched through the, you know, with a one and a half billion dollar bill this year, but um, the, or at least putting it out there. But I, I'm a little frustrated because I just, I think all, all members, or not all perhaps, but certainly the, almost all members would uh, embrace this effort of these uh, build outs of all these homes and get them up and going. And I don't know if it's just me, but I'm really impatient on this as well. I mean, because, uh, you know, my grandpa was USS Ward and uh, he's gone. You know, I have a Korean father in law and, you know, he's not healthy. You know, I mean, I know where these folks are at. And uh, so I'm with you in the frustration, but we should build it. We should just do it. And uh, maybe, you know, if it's here, that's fine, great. Um, but capital investment really would be, we definitely could do it. And I'm happy to work with you, Representative Detmer, and push for that. To, to build these out and get them done now. So thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to echo what Chair Detmer said. Uh, my son just passed his one year in the Navy and he's watching. All right. And, Chair Madam Detmer. Chair, and as you know, <clears throat> as many people know here, I have twin sons that are West Point graduates. They've had four deployments and they're watching too. One from Washington, D.C., one from Fort Hood, Texas. And I would probably say that most of the veterans that are here today also belong to a VFW, an American Legion. And uh, guess what we are doing in those, uh, those facilities? Uh, we're doing charitable gambling. And where does that money go? Much, much of it goes to the state of Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, folks, we are going to take just a little break. As I, uh, we haven't approved the minutes yet. I wanted to have the vets portion uh, addressed first since they traveled quite a distance. And Mr. Johnson, you're part of that uh, group as well. So me members, in your packets, you have the meeting minutes from April 17th. Representative Green, would you like to move the minutes? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the minutes. 
Representative Green moves the minutes for April 17th. All those in favor of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the minutes are adopted. Members, I also do have some um, housekeeping amendments to the bill that I wanted to do um, that address uh, some of the concerns since the bill came out. Uh, and these are author amendments. Uh, so I wanna do those first. We will do other amendments uh, at the end of the day. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take those, take care of the author amendments first, and then we'll do more of the testimony. And then at the end of the day, we'll do the rest of the amendments. So to that, um, I'm gonna start with, in your packets, you should have the A1 amendment. And this is actually Chair Detmer's bill. Um, and so Chair Detmer, do you just wanna offer just a couple of comments on this? Yes, Madam Chair, and, and uh, this was brought to me uh, several weeks ago in the um, upper Fort Snelling. Uh, there's 26 buildings up there that uh, <clears throat> have been boarded up for uh, for several years. In fact, uh, it kind of dates me because I know when I was uh, taking some military courses, uh, I, I took some courses in, in these facilities. And, uh, but uh, we're looking at uh, uh, what, what's, uh, it's not gonna cost the state any money. Uh, actually, uh, we're looking at bringing these, these facilities back online for uh, low-income housing and uh, with veteran preferences. Um, so, this what we heard in, in my committee uh, yesterday in the veterans division. And um, I just felt that this is something that we really should be looking at and uh, looking at the historic Fort Snelling, these, these beautiful buildings that have been sitting there for, for years now, uh, they can be renovated, brought back online. And uh, you know we're actually looking at out of those 26 buildings, there would be um, 176 units uh, that you're looking at about 355 bedrooms, uh, over 500 people that could be part of these facilities. It's uh, got broad support. Uh, the governor supports it. I got a letter from the governor. I have uh, a letter from uh, Congress, uh, various Congress people that are supporting this. So it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, we've waited this long to bring these, these buildings back online. Uh, I also have a letter from uh, Myron Franz, commissioner, in support of this project and the governor. So we need to take a really close look at this and being that there's no cost to the state, that there's funds there and that the, t the tax credits that are available for these, uh, this project, we need to, and we're looking at uh, over 80 million tax credits, uh, a million annual rent, um, so it's, it's a win-win situation for the state and it's a win-win situation for our veteran population and their families. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Detmer. And I know that you had quite a vigorous conversation in the Vets Division on this issue. Is there anyone that wishes to testify on the E1 amendment? All right, members, any questions? If not, I'm going to move uh, the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, the A1 amendment is adopted. Members, we're going to go next to the A4 amendment that was just handed out to you. Mr. Gehring, can you give us an explanation on the A4 amendment? Uh, Madam Chair, so in the DE2 amendment, there's a section on page 42 that expands the scope of uh, uh, the Office of Minute Services jurisdiction to include the state lottery, the statewide uh, radio board, and the various pension plans, uh, as well as the campaign finance board. Uh, this uh, language um, updates the way that those entities would be brought into the scope of uh, minutes duties by clarifying that uh, the services provided by minute must um, allow for the, those entities to um, meet fiduciary and other duties of care in their work. Okay. Is there anyone that wishes to testify on the A4 amendment? Members, <coughs> questions? If not, uh, I'm gonna renew my motion that the A4 amendment be adopted. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, A4 amendment is adopted. Um, okay, and then I'm going to do the A3 amendment. Mr. Gearing, can you walk us through the A3 amendment? 
Yep, so um, Madam Chair, the A3 amendment uh, replaces the existing section in the bill uh, that is Representative Anderson's bill that prohibits the Attorney General from entering contracts for legal services on a contingent fee basis. Um, that same prohibition uh, remains in this amendment, but what it does is provide an exception uh, for legal services that are provided on behalf of the Department of Human Services for Medicaid, uh, third-party liability, and also for false claims recoveries. Uh, and as a condition of that exception, um, there's a requirement here that the contracts must not exceed two years, uh, must be subject to competitive bidding, uh, and then also that uh, the Attorney General and the Commissioner of Human Services must file an annual uh, joint report to the legislature that provides detail on the types of uh, services provided on these contracts. Okay. Is there anyone that wishes to testify on the A3 amendment? Members' questions. All those in favor of the A3 amendment, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. The A3 amendment is adopted. Members, we've got the A2 amendment. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Madam Chair, so the A2 amendment uh, again replaces a section that's existing in the bill. Uh, this is a pension related amendment. Uh, the existing language in the bill provides that when a dissolving uh, 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 fire, Firefighters Relief Association, when, when assets are distributed, uh, that the assets must be used to provide benefits to uh, uh, beneficiaries of the fund. Uh, this changes that language to provide that when assets cancel, um, uh, following the dissolution of an association, they either cancel to the general fund of the municipality only if the municipality made contributions to the fund, uh, and if the municipality, municipality did not make contributions to the fund, then the remaining assets would cancel to the state. Okay. Is there anyone that wishes to testify to the A2 amendment? Members, questions? All those in favor of the A2 amendment, please say aye. 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 Um, those opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Okay. So, members, we're back on track for taking testimony on the omnibus bill. Uh, Commissioner Franz. Commissioner, welcome to the committee. If you can please state your name for the record and who you represent. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Myron Franz, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to divert a little bit from my opening remarks and talk a little bit about bonding. If you don't mind, I could answer a few of the questions that were uh, raised uh, about the bonding uh, for the uh, veterans' homes, if you'd care to sure. entertain that. Um, yeah, just, yes, sure, go ahead. Just take, just take a second. So, as, as you mentioned, the $1.5 billion bonding bill by the governor uh, did include, I think it was $38 million for the veterans' homes for the uh, asset care and preservation to take care of the business that, that we need to take care of to, uh, to maintain those, those homes. And as you also mentioned, there, there, was a, uh, there were no local projects or very few local projects included. And these homes would be considered the local projects. But they would, the governor would entertain adding those, uh, those particular projects as bonding projects to the bill. Uh, we've had this discussion before, but uh, you know, just since 2011, Minnesota management budget and managing the portfolio of bonds that we own, we have saved over $300 million in interest payments over the life of the loans that we have refinanced since 2011, which obviously brings down our daily uh, or annual payment of interest each year, which provides us the resources to have a larger uh, bonding bill than a billion dollars. So I would encourage all of you, the members, to support a bonding bill that brings in local projects, including these uh, these homes. Any other questions on that? Otherwise, I'm happy to. Oh, I do, Commissioner, just a couple of things. Um, so is the governor planning on issuing a new uh, bonding bill proposal that would reflect this as part of it, or is he going to stick to the $1.5 billion to, that didn't include the veterans' homes construction? Madam Chair, members, the governor is, is certainly, he's not going to propose a new one. He's open to in the process of having the bonding bills heard in committee, he's open to that process where the bonding bill would be amended and these would be added to a bonding bill. Okay, and so Commissioner, so help me out. If we go the bonding route, obviously you pay on interest. So how much more in interest would we be paying versus cash, of course, you're not paying interest on that. So how much would that be? Uh, Madam Chair, as you, as you know, this, uh, in, the, in the forecast we estimated an $800 million bonding bill would be passed this year. It's something we do 
uh, every year in the forecast is estimate a, a, a bonding bill size. So if, if the bonding bill for the governor was uh, it was adopted at 1.5 billion, that would be another 11 million 11 million dollars this biennium on top. Uh, additional interest charge for this biennium above an $800 million bonding bill. It would be uh, about $80 million in, in uh, 20 and 21 more in interest than an $800 million bonding bill. So that's the incremental cost of going from an $800 million to a $1.5 billion bonding bill. I don't have the numbers for if we added any more on the local side. Yeah, no, I mean, that's just helpful to know because, you know, I'm, Bonding is nice, but it also comes with the cost that you pay, and that's always shifted to future generations to, to pay for that. So I appreciate your comments on that. Commissioner, I assume that you're here for other reasons as well. I do. I, do. I have a few comments. So let me get started. I know you have a lot of testifiers, and you have a... Oh, you know what? I apologize. Sure. I think, did you guys have questions uh, regarding that? I apologize. Um, Representative Pugh. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner Franz. Uh, my question was with regard to the uh, interest that the state of Minnesota is paying on the debt service, and I'm wondering if you could share with with the body what what that is. Uh, Madam Chair, members, yeah, it's a little over a billion dollars. Uh, uh, about a billion dollars every year is the annual interest payment we make on all the outstanding uh, general obligation debt. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Representative Vogel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As long as we got to the bonding. Uh, Commissioner, when, when you do your projections, how much do you project in bonding normally for a biennium? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, it's a, based on the convention that we currently have, the convention is that on, a, um, on an, even, or a, an even numbered year like this, we would estimate an $800 million bonding bill and $230 million for the next year. That's based on what we've done in the last five to ten, kind of an average of the last five to ten years. So what we try to do is to estimate uh, what we think is sort of the minimum amount, and that's for, therefore we forecast that interest payment in the forecast. So it's not something we have to budget for in the legislature's budget or in the governor's budget. Representative Ogle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner, uh, it, w when you add up all of the payments coming out of the general fund for bonding, whether it's general obligation, appropriation, or whatever, what is that for biennium? Commissioner. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, that is the billion dollars. So the billion dollar uh, payment, interest payments, is for all the outstanding debt that we have every year. That's an annual, that's an annual number. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, over the biennium, you're saying it would be about two billion. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I thought it was closer to a billion and a half. But in any case, if we're borrowing a billion thirty, um, um, uh, a billion thirty million over a biennium, and we're paying out a billion five, let's say, if we didn't have the debt at all, we would actually have four hundred million dollars more that we could spend on projects and not have the state have any debt. Would that be the case, or, or would you disagree with those figures? Commissioner? Madam Chair, uh, uh, Representative, no, I think the key really is in, any, in management of any capital asset um, uh, portfolio, we would always recommend that long-term projects that have long-term effects, be, we use capital or uh, bonding debt to finance that rather than the operating uh, cash that would be available to operate for agencies or other programs. But you're right, we would, if we started uh, paying with cash and uh, we didn't have this debt, we, we could fund, uh, fund projects with cash instead of that debt, but we'd have to figure out how to pay off that uh, uh, about $6 billion in debt to do that. Representative. So, Madam Chair, my point is, Commissioner, that I, I realize that we could do a lot more borrowing, but borrowing is optionally, um, you, you know, we're, we're forcing that debt on our generations to come to pay, and we've now gotten to a position where we can't even borrow enough to make, uh, we're borrowing less than the payments we're making, which w when you look at things like this and we have the revenue available from entities that are indirectly already paying into this fund, I would suggest, Madam Chair, that the cash that we have available in this fund is a good way to go because not only are we going to save the interest, but we're being prudent looking to the future for our children, our grandchildren, and those that come after because if we can indeed retire this debt, the general fund hit won't be any worse than it is, but we'll be able to do more projects than we're already doing. So thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. 
All right, now, Commissioner, you do have some other things that you want to mention to us? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me, uh, let me uh, dive right in. I know you have a lot of other people. I just wanted to articulate a couple of general issues, and I'll get right to the MMB, uh, MMB questions. But I think one of, the, one of the concerns that we have is that, uh, as Governor Dayton mentioned in his April 9th letter to the leaders, was that uh, he would prefer that we focus on those areas where we agree there needs to be some action, whether it's the opioid crisis, safe schools, uh, elderly care, pension reform, and we believe that some of the issues in this particular bill deviate from the governor's uh, wish that we, we focus on those areas where we agree and we get those issues done. Part of the concerns we have are some of the cuts, frankly, to the agencies and rehashing old arguments from last year. Obviously, we went through a biennial budget process last year. We uh, agreed on a budget. That budget was passed. The governor signed it. And we are interested in dealing with those concerns that we have that need to be adjusted uh, since that, uh, since last year, not in going back and, and relitigating the budget matters from last year. One of, the th one of the concerns that we have is that uh, House File 4061 makes budget reductions to the Department of Administration, Minnesota Management and Budget, Department of Revenue, the Department of Human Rights. And this really, not only is it contrary to the budget agreement that we made last year, it runs contrary to the public perception that when the legislature passes laws and gives uh, assignments and duties for the, for the administration or the executive, we will have the funds to carry out those, those functions. This bill, for example, attempts to prioritize agency expenditures to those services that are, that are provided directly to the public. Well, I have to assure you that uh, what the executive branch does is to provide service to the public. That is our mission. And one of the idea, the idea that central administration dollars can be cut without having any effect on the delivery of services to the public simply isn't true. I can tell you from my experience as a business executive that every business has central administrative expenses that have to be maintained. You have to, to maintain a, a salary or a, a, a payroll office, and you have to maintain uh, certain benefits. But th those are the kinds of things that you do to maintain a, a workforce. And without those, you simply can't do that. And the other problem that you have in the public sector, or not problem, but the other issue you have is that there are many requirements in law for the agencies to do certain things. So the idea that we can cut administrative services and not have any effect on public services uh, simply isn't the way that things operate. The other problem that we have is, for example, in the area of salary savings. The bill contains a provision that prohibits an agency from taking salary savings that happens when someone leaves government service and in that interim before you replace that person, or maybe you don't want to replace that position right away, those are what we call salary savings. Well, this uh, bill would require the, uh, the agency to not take that savings and invest it in any other operation of the agency. Well, that's exactly the way you manage agencies, is by prioritizing on a regular, monthly, ongoing basis what are the needs? What, what are the services that are being required by the public? And how do you best provide those services? So the idea that we can't manage, an agency can't manage those, those uh, savings from having a position open for a while is contrary to the way of managing, uh, managing a state agency. The, one of the things I'd like to address is something we've talked about before, and that's the Legislative Budget Office. We believe that the, we've, we've met with the author of the bill and talked about some of our concerns, but we think some of the changes in this bill run contrary to the agreement that the, when the LBO would become effective and also would re reduce the MMB's budget in anticipation of the LBO. One of the things we'll do is we're still revi reviewing the bill and we'll have some more specific recommendations in the next day or so that we'll provide uh, in a letter. But I think part of the, what we have a problem with is that we must deliver the statutory responsibilities of the fiscal note process uh, to the uh, LBO, but we, and we, but we must do it so that they have operational control of the fiscal note tracking system. But we're not sure what that means, and so we need to work on what does operational control of the fiscal note tracking system really mean. We also have some strong concerns about the data protection requirements. We believe that basic governance requires that the fiscal note process should be open and transparent to the public. And we don't think this bill adequately protects the data, private, the data protection uh, provisions so that the bill, so that the language and the fiscal notes are in fact made public. Similar to the Office of Legislative Auditor, there are opportunities for the 
OLA's work to be made public, even though some of it has to be maintained in a confidential fashion. We think that that arrangement should be similar to the proposal for the Legislative Budget Office. The second issue that I want to talk about is the, is the, the creation of a centralized workplace for um, sexual harassment prevention at MMB. We appreciate the committee's consideration of this issue, and we really welcome the additional resources to support our efforts. You may remember that Governor Dayton included a request in his supplemental budget to create an independent office that would process harassment complaints and provide additional investigation resources and oversight for expanded training for sexual harassment prevention. Now, in addition to funding for the expanded training for sexual harassment prevention, an employee survey and an audit procedure are among the other items that we uh, propose going forward. This, this request is so important because it really under, underscores our commitment to implementing recommendations based on our January, 18, January 2018 report on sexual harassment prevention in the executive branch. However, the problem with the bill is instead of promoting the goals of inclusiveness and respect, we believe the language would actually end up cutting agency human resource and affirmative action offices and deny basic and critical support. And this would happen in two ways. First, the language expands the duties of the office beyond what we asked for, beyond what we requested. In addition to sexual harassment or discrimination, it also includes all misconduct <coughs> in agencies. That misconduct investigation activity is currently conducted by each individual agency. So this, this bill would ex greatly expand the reach and scope of this office, and the bill simply does not provide sufficient funds to accomplish this. But the other important point to remember is that the goal of the office is to provide direction and support and oversight to the areas of sexual harassment and discrimination. This is a first step, and it's a necessary first step we don't want to uh, begin the process of dismantling what is, our, what is in the, the agencies now and what is working, and that is the typical employee misconduct procedures that exist, the <coughs> affirmative action officers that are there, and that process that exists to take care of those complaints. So the bill and the idea of the office is a first step, and this, the, the language in this bill would take it beyond the first step and require all the investigations to be performed, not just for sexual harassment, uh, but also for misconduct. And we think that the appropriate way to do this is in a small step where we start the, start the process, oversee this process, conduct many of the investigations, but also oversee and support those agencies that need additional support. And some don't necessarily need additional support right away. And we don't want to be, we don't want to be uh, duplicative in any way with some of the agency work that's going on. So we're concerned that the office has as designed in this bill would, be, would be really require duplicative work and would be difficult to, to monitor with the human resource officers we currently have and the affirmative action officers we, we currently have. The core purpose of the governor's uh, proposal was to create a new and independent office to provide employees with an additional option to report harassment and to ensure highly skilled and independent staff are available to investigate complaints uniformly across our very diverse state government exec enterprise. And pursuant to these statutory duties, at the duties that I already have as commissioner of MMB are to, are to report to this legislature any uh, cost savings that we have or to report any uh, elimination of services that we might, uh, we might find in the process of implementing this procedure. So we will report back to this uh, committee and to the legislature if we find savings or any other uh, duplication of services. But we believe that the, the amendment as the proposal as drafted does not really embody the importance and the development of the sexual harassment prevention office as we envisioned it. The other concern we have is the way that it's funded and that is from the transfer of funds from both the stadium reserve or from funds from other agency. Uh, as was mentioned earlier this morning, we do have some resources. I think it was Representative Lilly that talked about the fact that we do have resources to solve some of these problems that uh, Chair Detmer has brought up in the veterans area that are very admirable. And, but the, we've had, we have these resources because we've been managing state government very wisely, very fiscally sound for the last seven years. We have a uh, budget uh, reserve, state reserve of $1.6 billion. We have a cash balance 
of $350 million. We have a stadium reserve right now for the bank stadium that's about around $40 million. I think it's $39 million. Well, that is a rainy day fund in and of itself for the stadium. And so if you take the money, the $30 million that the bill directs from the stadium reserve fund out of the stadium reserve, it would be left with $9 million. We believe that a minimum of one year's worth of debt should be in the stadium reserve fund at all times. We agree, Madam Chair, that the fund is growing and we need, we need to assess in the future how much money should, should be re retained in that fund. But right now, we only have $39 million. Now, the projections show the fund growing <coughs> over the next three years, but those are projections and those are, those are not actual dollars. So we do not recommend cutting the stadium reserve based on future projections when, in fact, the cut to the reserve right now would take it to down to about $9 million. The, the other concern we have about the stadium reserve, using money from the stadium reserve, is that uh, the, uh, as we go forward and other changes are made to the stadium, any stadium authority bill, we need to consider what ongoing operational and, <coughs> and capital in, uh, requirements they're going to have going forward. Another concern we have with the bill, Madam Chair, is the bill cuts $500,000 from the sexual harassment prevention funding if MMB does not realize savings from a new gain-sharing program. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but that number has no factual basis, and I'll uh, des describe a little bit of the problems we have in implementing the gain-sharing program. I would like to also mention that reducing agency budgets to pay for min -lars is effectively a budget cut to the agencies. As Commissioner Clyborne will testify to in a few minutes, she's communi communicated with you numerous times uh, that the I-Team has a clear roadmap to finalize the Minlaris project, but subjecting other important state services to, is not the path to solve the Minlaris problems and is likely contrary to statutory authorization of some of those funds. I would like to just mention a few things about the gain sharing program then be uh, open for questions. As you know, we've had an ongoing dialogue. In fact, we were scheduled, I think, to meet yesterday or this morning about that. But we'll, we'll get to that soon because we wanted to come up forward, Madam Chair, with some suggestions about how to implement that program. Uh, you know, the other, just but in terms of talking about the forecasting and the savings, you know, we've looked at other states, and most gain-sharing programs in other states don't spend any more than 10000 to 20000 a year in savings. And most of the awards in other states, like California, New York, and North Dakota, or about $1,000 or even less, and represent about 10 to 20% of the savings of that particular item. The other thing is the, the statutory language restricts the payment based upon the fiscal year in which the savings are projected, and it's going to be difficult from a procedural matter to get the savings to the employee during that particular fiscal year. And the, the final matter I'd like to mention is the bonus awards. We do have an issue. We have to figure out how to... Uh, interweave them with the, the labor agreements that we have. About 90% of our workforce are part, they're part of a, a bargaining unit, and about 90% of our workforce would not qualify for one of these awards. So we will work with the chair going forward on ways to implement the gain sharing program because we think there are ways that we can do it and to make it effective, but we think the savings here simply are not going to be achievable in the first year. And I'm open for any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's it? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, no, I went on quite a while. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, any questions for the Commissioner? Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, um, I guess one thing, just as a comment, I find it interesting that you're very concerned about, uh, about savings in all these other uh, places, but you're not concerned that we're paying $2 billion every biennium on bonding when we're only borrowing a little over a billion every two years on bonding. It doesn't really make a lot of sense that there would, there would be some savings there if we could reduce that debt. But you had mentioned um, uh, for you were concerned about the cost savings from uh, when you, when an employee for, well, either is let go or, or retires or whatever, and you want to be able to use that money. Uh, the concern that I have is that once that money is used for something else and it becomes part of your base and you're continually using it for that, and then that employee has to be replaced, do you, has there ever been an instance where that's happened then you came back and said we need another employee, another FTE, so we need more money for that employee? Or do you stop using the money for, for uh, the cost savings 
for what you're using it for and put it back into the employee. Commissioner. Madam Chair, Representative, well, that's a little difficult to answer because it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing process. We have, you know, almost 35,000 employees and <laughs> there are people coming and going all the time, literally in, in the workplace. But, you know, as a manager of a, of a particular agency, what we, what is typically going to happen is if someone leaves a, 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 the state service and that job, they were performing a particular function, you will normally replace that person and, and that FTE to keep that function going. But there are times when we simply are concerned that we won't, we, we may have, uh, we may need to uh, reduce our expenditures to make our budget by the end of the biennium. And, and there, that's one way you can do that is by not replacing someone right, right away. You can reduce the cost of the agency and get to your target for the biennial uh, budget. But sometimes you might decide, you know, uh, now that that uh, person is gone, uh, we'll, we'll let's reassess. Do we need three people in that area or four people, or do we need that person at all? Or, or, so it's an ongoing assessment, and that's what your HR professionals in every agency really need to provide for you as a commissioner is what are the needs, what kind of demands do you have for workforce, what type of talent do you need? That's one of the reasons we've been spending a lot of time on talent development and trying to make sure that we bring people in at, at the right level and we've reduced some of the overall uh, minimum qualifications because sometimes the tendency is for you to want to hire the person for that the same skill set of the person that left and they may have been there 20 years well you may not be able to go get the person out in the in the private sector that has that same skill set you may need to start out with someone at a, at a lower skill set and then train them to take over so th there are a lot of factors that go into whether when you decide to replace that position that's open or not and it uh, you try to manage the budget to make sure that you come in at the two-year budget um, number. I hope that kind of answers your question, but it's, it's... Representative Green. I guess just a comment. Well, as someone who's run a business and been around business a lot, one of the frustrating things for me to come here, and it's, it's not just with your agency, Commissioner, but with all the agencies, um, every time they're, they're given a task, uh, we hear, well, that's going to be X number of FTEs, and it's going to be X number of million dollars to hire that FTE. And uh, and now I'm hearing and, and from the agencies, not just yours, that we have cost savings when we let these people go, yet every time you have something new to do, your your existing employees are so stressed that they can't take on anything new, you need someone new, now you're telling me that there's cost savings out there from when you let them go, and you don't really have to replace them. I'm getting mixed messages, and it is frustrating. So, any other members? A representative. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just, I have a bunch of questions, but I was just curious. Uh, um, what What do you think will happen if this makes it to the governor's desk? Commissioner? Madam Chair, members, well, I, I don't uh, forecast what the governor will or will not do. I, and that's the reason I started off talking about his April 9th letter and other letters, because he's sent out a number of letters on whether it's opioid problem or safe schools or the pension for reform uh, to try to figure out ways. There are a number of things that we need to do this session that we agree need to be done. And so his focus has really been, let's do those now. Let's not w have those wait till the end of session. And let's not roll them all up into one big omnibus bill because that makes it just really troublesome. He has proposed, and I think we've struggled with this, understandably so, but he's proposed standalone bills that solve these particular problems that we agree on. And let's, let's do that work, let's agree on that. And, uh, and so that's why uh, this bill makes it more difficult for him to uh, to be favorable about. The idea of making cuts to agencies is a problem in this bill. The idea that we have some policy provisions in here is a problem to the governor. So these, these kinds of issues and this kind of an omnibus bill make it difficult for us to come to an agreement. And I think it just, it just doesn't bode well if we're going to have a, an omnibus bill that doesn't take care of, doesn't have in, even in here some of the basic problems we need to solve and creates other problems that the governor sees with the bill. So it's, it's problematic. Representative Lilly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your answer. It was kind of what I was hoping you'd say is, uh, um, you know, we're in a time where there are some things that need adjustments and some goals that, you know, the, you mentioned the opiates. There's goals that are clear that we should, as a state, uh, 
uh, being uh, focusing on or or there's clear that there's been some problems that we need to look at but to make it worse possibly is is unfortunate so I was glad to hear your answer I uh, um, I, I likewise has some concerns you know and will articulate that but I appreciate your answer of you know building a better Minnesota and working on the problems and then working on well working on the problems it's together I don't know that this bill is the solution so anyways thank you for your answer any other questions members uh, commissioner just a couple of comments um, you know I sat in tax committee yesterday and we were going through the the governor's bill and of course there were provisions in the governor's bill that he had signed into law uh, last year um, and then of course you have the issue today we heard from the Minnesota Supreme Court that they ruled in favor of the legislature and the governor regarding to the uh, state auditors lawsuit uh, against the state um, and you know I know in that time the governor had signed the bill into law and had issued an affidavit um, saying that he didn't support his signature into law so you know I think that that's something that we experience here at the legislature um, quite a bit so I was surprised when you said that um, but regarding representative Green's comments on the salary savings and LBO in general I think at the legislature what we have found is on the fiscal notes we're given directives from the agencies that some a program is going to cost X amount of dollars and you're going to need X amount of FTEs and when you have a salary savings situation where you have a program that then you don't fill the position and instead take that money to disperse among the agency elsewhere yeah, I think it's a challenge for us as the legislature then to say to these fiscal notes is this really an accurate reflection of what this program costs and the number of FTEs that are entailed with it so I think it gets down to an issue of transparency and making sure that the funds that we appropriate for these programs are actually directed towards what we're told that they're going to be and it gets down to the issue I think of what representative Vogel has worked so hard on on the LBO piece uh, and then uh, as far as the sexual harassment um, office piece you know welcome your feedback I, I will look through the the details that your office was able to provide and I do appreciate that I think I got that on Monday or Tuesday I can't remember when and so I looked at that quite carefully about um, what we are doing on that piece um, and I think you know one of the comments in in that directive was that we have uh, this this entity that can have consistent corrective actions and so I think that we're trying to get towards that consistency um, and so that's what the goal is with uh, that piece um, and then you know some of the other issues I think we could probably have a conversation later on we just haven't been able to connect <laughs> we both have very busy schedules but I look forward to having that conversation and I appreciate you coming here today so Thank you. and look forward to continuing to work with the governor um, you know it's a give-and-take process I have tried to recognize some of his priorities as part of this bill and hopefully he'll recognize some of the legislature's priorities as well so thank you Matt. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we've got next on the <coughs> Commissioner Clyborne. I'm going to turn over the chair to Representative Nash. Welcome to the committee. Welcome, Com Commissioner. If you would state your name for the record and uh, tell us who you represent. Good morning. My name is Joanna Clyborn. I am the Commissioner of Minnesota Information Technology Services. Okay. Commissioner, to your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning on House File 4016. I want to express my strong concern regarding several provisions of House File 4016. This bill specifically would require all IT projects to be outsourced unless law appropriating money for the project expressly directs the chief state chief information officer to design or build the project in-house. <laughs> Members should be aware that the vast majority of IT projects are funded through agency operating, um, operating and budget programs and not through specific appropriations for an IT project. So while this exception language appears to provide a path for projects to be done in-house where it makes sense to do so, the approach really simply is unworkable. These software projects may be initiated to add additional features to an existing software program application or to perform a, a version upgrade 
or to comply with the change in federal regulations or compliance requirements, or they may be implemented um, because many of the changes in the programs and services that are put into law by this body every year. In 2017, 270 information technology projects were initiated in the executive branch, and most of them were related to software applications. As I previously testified, Minute already works with agencies to conduct a build or buy analysis when a new software application is being considered. But requiring that all software related project be outsourced unless the legislature has explicitly directed it to be done in-house would have a debilitating effect on project timelines and would significantly increase project costs. For example, I would like you to imagine a scenario where a federal agency changes reporting requirements for federally funded programs and makes that federal funding contingent upon compliance with the new reporting requirements. Now imagine that those same change requirements uh, necessitates a software change in an existing legacy system. Under the current law, the agency is able to rely on the dedicated minute staff to get the work done. But under this bill, because the appropriation used to fund the project did not expressly stipulate that minute shall do the work associated with the project, the project um, would have to actually, the agency would have to issue a request for a proposal to a vendor to do the work, significantly increasing the time and cost involved. It simply makes no sense to put time and money into issuing an RFP um, to find a vendor resource when we're capable of doing the work, especially if that project work might be on a 20 or 30 year old legacy system when the minute staff who have worked on these systems have done so for years, if not decades, and are ready and available to do the work. We will end up paying vendors or contractors for months of work simply to make them familiar with and capable of doing work that we already have in our existing system. And that would be an incredibly poor use of tax dollars in this particular case. Additionally, what happens when session is, when, when session is not in? And how do we handle that type of a situation where we have to wait until we can actually get in front of a legislative body to get authorization to do such a simple upgrade? Secondly, I want to relay my concerns and the governor's strong opposition to cutting other agencies' budgets in order to fund the continued work on MinLARS. As the governor has made very clear, these agencies and Minnesotans, they deserve not to be punished for an IT system shortcomings that they had absolutely nothing to do with. Third, I want to relay my concern with the unfunding mandate and unfunded mandate in the bill that would require agencies to dedicate 3.5% of their IT budget on cybersecurity. While I truly do appreciate the original bill's author commitment to the issue of cybersecurity and the determination of seeing a greater investment in that area, I am concerned with no new funding being provided for the bill in cybersecurity. It will result in IT budget cuts that ultimately exasperate our current existing IT challenges. It may result in the delay of system modernization projects, reduced investments in application maintenance and support, or delays in replacement of hardware or other equipment that increases the risk of hardware failures and systems outages. I urge this committee to consider funding of the governor's recommendations for cybersecurity, which would provide approximately $19.7 in new funding for cybersecurity this biennium. With that said, members, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and to relay my concerns and testify on House File 4016. Thank you, Commissioner. Members, questions before I, uh, Representative Olson. Uh, thank you, Chair Nash. Um, I have a couple of questions um, to the commissioner. First, within this bill, does more come under, does more responsibility that wasn't in your office come under your purview now? Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members. Um, it does. We, we assume additional boards and responsibilities, and that would be an unfunded uh, requirement. We stand ready and willing to do so if so dictated, but it does put additional uh, requirements on our agency. Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and also at the same time, Commissioner, does this bill then tell you that you need to privately contract for some services as well? Commissioner Clyburn. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members. 
It does. Um, and just to be clear for the record, Minute already does a build or buy analysis for everything. As I've testified before, it makes absolutely no sense for us to build something that already exists in the commercial market. And if it already exists, why would we not use that? But sometimes that system that exists out there needs to be purchased and modified in order to meet the needs of the agency. And sometimes it doesn't exist or it is more cost effective to actually build it in house. But it would under this bill require no matter what I'm doing to fund that outside of the agency and to provide a contract for that. Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And my last question would be, um, we're, we're addressing cybersecurity. Do we actually sufficiently fund cybersecurity in this bill? Commissioner. Mr. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members, I do not believe so. There are multiple ways to get at the problem, but I think in this particular way, it's another unfunded, unfunded mandate that opens up more problems. And so with the governor's 19.7 request, I think it gets us ahead in the modernization piece that we need, it provides us the tools that we need in order to detect and to stop uh, attacks before they begin. And additionally, it provides the data center security and consolidation that needs to occur, as well as some issues in regards to the special operations center that manages right now and, and monitors and, and deals with the threats that are affecting our state to provide for an ability for them to run 24-7 operations. And frankly, it should be 24-7 hour operations. Representative Olson, all done? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. I have one, no, oh, not oh. all done. <laughs> then by all means, I thought that you had said you were, had one last question, but go I, ahead. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up into a comment then. Very good. Um, and just say, so from those answers of those questions, just succinctly, I'm hearing that we're through this bill asking the office, we're giving them more responsibilities in some regards. So we trust them with some things we, that our state government should do, but yet it's, the other time we're tying their hands and saying, requiring private contractors and saying the privatization of some of our government services is good. And we're woefully underfunding cybersecurity. And I just think those three themes are just really important for us to keep in mind um, and what that will do in the future. And I, it causes great concern. So I just wanted to ask those questions and highlight that. Thank you. Very good. Well, Commissioner, um, let's start with cybersecurity. I believe if I watched your press conference the other day. You said that you're currently spending at about two and a half percent on cybersecurity. Is that correct? Mr. Matt. Chair, Madam Chair, members, that is correct. We're approximately at a two percent level. Okay. Well, Commissioner, if you're currently at a two percent level, as you just said, the provision in this bill would appropriate three and a half percent, which more than doubles what you're currently spending. So, to Representative Olson's concern, <laughs> woefully, I believe was your word, woefully underfunding it. Uh, we're more than doubling what you're currently spending on cybersecurity as an ongoing appropriation. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, no, it's not. So the 2% is an average across. Some agencies spend more, others spend less, depending on the agency and, and the, what, their, what type of data they control, for example. Um, it's not a matter of increasing the spending, but rather you're, you're, for lack of a better word, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So if I'm an agency, I have to figure out what part do I create risk in? Is it not updating that system, which, oh, by the way, exposes us as well? Or is it, am I creating additional funding for funneling money towards uh, patching programs or updated vendor software or something along those lines? We've been doing way too little in our modernization efforts and way too little in our upgrading of security posture. The private sector, I, I believe as you were with us this morning during the cybersecurity summit, um, and which was relayed by that panel as well, um, spends on average on their IT anywhere from four to 6%. Uh, and those agencies or entities that deal with much more sensitive, anywhere from seven to 10%, especially those in the financial or the healthcare sector, those types of things. Well, Commissioner, again, I, you know, in the testimony that we received when I presented this before we built it into the omnibus bill, um, we talked about a couple different things. Primarily, one, making sure that you weren't uh, growing IT past the ability to outstrip the, the security that you're putting around it. 
And we heard testimony from your office that uh, there were concerns about perhaps out kicking your coverage, I believe was my term that was agreed to. Um, so, you know, in, in your analogy right there, you're saying that we are, we'd be hampering agencies from doing projects. Uh, you know, certainly patching is something that we want to make sure is going on, and I'm sure you agree with that. But, you know, doing new projects that perhaps are going to go unsecured is a problem from, from my perspective. So if we're using my number of 3.5%, uh, and from your te from the testifier from your office uh, that that might actually slow down some projects that uh, would go unsecured. I, th I think that's a, a fair trade-off, and I believe it's a trade-off that's also being done in the private mm -hmm. sector. Um, but some of my other concern is, you know, this is a programmatic, ongoing way to fund cybersecurity, and we tried before you came on board last year. We we appropriated 26 million dollars for cybersecurity, 26 million dollars more than you're currently asking for from your press conference the other day. Uh, the governor saw fit to negotiate that away for something else. So I took it upon myself and worked with mm -hmm. Chair Anderson to find a way to create an ongoing, sustainable way to fund cybersecurity. And from my perspective, and I think uh, from many on this committee, that that is a breath of fresh air and that we are taking cyber quite seriously. We understand that uh, we are charged with making sure that money is spent judiciously to secure Minnesotans' data. Um, so we have found a way to do that. This is not a budget year. We can't just plunk down another $26 million. And uh, we have gone to a policy perspective to, to address this. And Commissioner, I, I'm just flabbergasted that uh, you know, you're saying that we're woefully, or I guess it was Representative Olson that said we were woefully underfunding cybersecurity. And, and you didn't discount that. You know, we're putting in more than you currently spend on cybersecurity, uh, and we're trying to also, through that, keep in check the, the, the unfettered growth of some things that would go unsecured. So I, I, I'm just confused as to why this is such a problem. Commissioner? Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members, as I said before, there are multiple ways to look at this problem, but I do think that we have not been funded. We are doing well in Minnesota, but not well enough. The threat grows and is ever more sophisticated. Um, there are things that we should be doing that I believe we're not doing as well or we could do better in, such as funding the detection tools needed to talk about the securing and, and consolidation of those data centers. Less data centers equals less threat, right? Um, or at least opportunity for threat. There are methodologies in which we can boost our, our funding stream without outgrowing our coverage. I believe that the governor's bill uh, does that. Additionally, I want to make very clear, I had a very frank conversation when we were looking at these numbers and said, is there any fluff in here? Is there any fluff in 19.7? Because I'm not crazy about asking for money I don't need. Because I don't want to come back to you and go, oops, I really didn't need a this at the end. And it was made very clear to me that we have budgeted to down to the penny exactly what needs to be done in order to move forward in such a manner that protects our state. Now we can argue about whether or not 3.5% gets us to that dollar amount, but we can't deny that what we're doing is we're telling agencies basically to forgo some things in order to ensure that they meet the 3.5% threshold, whether they're there or not. And so what happens in those cases, right? Well, Commissioner, let me stop you there for just a second. Um, so in, in the press conference that you had the other day uh, after we made our presentation, uh, apparently, I believe, of that 19 million, 10 million is going to um, facilitate consolidation of data centers. Is, is that correct? Mr. Chair, Madam, uh, Madam Chair members. Yeah. That is correct. And if you need very specific detail, I do have my CISO with me here today. Well, Commissioner, we'll get to that maybe in just a second. But Commissioner, again, before you came on last year, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a bill that uh, facilitated and, and I believe it was, it was said forced consolidation, which in some ways it did. But it, it surprised me when I found out that the fiscal note that was associated with my bill that is accomplishing essentially the same thing that you're trying, the fiscal note came to in excess of $10 million. Um, and you've only gone down two data centers, I believe, in the last 12 months. Um, so my fiscal note was somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 or 18 million, and yours is at 10 million. And I'm curious as to what changed. 
Um, and perhaps did someone put their thumb on the scale back when it was my bill and maybe not on yours or, or what? I'm just conf I'm confused. And perhaps if you needed to phone a friend to, to give specifics, then that would be entirely acceptable. Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, <coughs> members. Um, I, I will have the CCO come talk to it. I, I was not here, so I can't talk about a fiscal note at that time. But I am telling you what I need now and what I think the correct number is. So I, I can't account for the differences there, but I can certainly tell you that I believe that the request I have now is appropriate. So I'm going to ask Mr. Aaron Call, who's my chief information um, yep. security officer, well, to come in. And, and Commissioner, um, I'm going to have Chair Anderson ask a question as uh, Mr. Call is coming down because she's been on the list for a little bit. <coughs> Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Um, I think some of these answers, if you can provide them afterwards, that would be helpful for us. But we do need to get to session, so I just wanted to be able to get this question in so that we can move on and get onto session and, and then be able to start uh, after at 1 o'clock. So my question to you is this. So a couple of things. Um, in your $19 million request, you've got $10 million for consolidation. And this goes back to 2011, way before your time as commissioner. But I will tell you, we were, um, then it was a bipartisan um, bill, um, probably two of the most unlikely lawmakers together, Representative Downey, Representative Phyllis Kahn, came together and said, we need to do this consolidation because it would save the state money. And I get a little concerned when minute comes and says, now we need another $10 million to do consolidation. And oh, by the way, we are now in the year 2018 and we aren't at consolidation. So I just have, I wanna put that out there as a concern for me. But then also, you know, when you're talking about this whole issue on the Minlars piece, you know, the governor was very clear and he said, you know, this, this is my fault. I am to blame for this, you know, the buck stops here and, and so forth. And I think everybody appreciates that when a leader, you know, says, you know, it takes account for their actions. Um, but in that regard, then we shouldn't be blaming the taxpayers for the Minlars fix. And with the fee that you're proposing, and, and all these charges and extra money that you're proposing, you are then punishing the taxpayer rather than the people that really should be responsible for it. And so that's what is part of this legislation, is making sure that we're not being punitive to the taxpayers in Minnesota for something that is completely outside of their control. So that's just my comments, uh, sure. Mr. Chair. We, yeah. and we're gonna come back yep. at one o'clock. Uh, in room uh, 10, our regular committee room. Um, so, we just so members, we're going to stand in recess until 1 p.m., and we will be in room 10. So we are in recess.